everybody. My name is Captain Shoemaker. I'm so glad that you came. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about why we're doing this and, and kind of who I am if you don't know who I am. I'm in the medical group. I'm one of the nurse practitioners up there. I've been in healthcare for nearly 20 years. If you can think of the department at the hospital, I've worked there. But specifically for the last 10 years, my goal has been medical weight management. And I've helped people with their diabetes, their high blood pressure, their heart disease, their ulcerative colitis, their Crohn's, their headaches, their aches and pains, their fertility. A variety of ailments can be healed through food. So uh, that's what I do on the civilian side is I help heal people through food and I believe that that's possible. Next month we're launching our sugar-free challenge. So I want to invite everybody. I'd like to see the auditorium full with lots of people excited and geared up with the sugar-free challenge just in time for you know, Lent or other seasons. Um, it's about having everyone come together with a friendly competition going 30 days sugar-free and I want to teach you guys how to do that next month and I'm going to bring in a machine that's a body composition analyzer. It's going to tell you what percentage is bone, muscle, water, fat, and organ and uh, then we'll be able to look at statistics 30 days from then and maybe whoever has the best story, the best uh, data, the best whatever might win some sort of prize. We haven't determined the prize yet. Maybe these gentlemen can help me think of a prize of sorts. Uh, but I think it'll be a neat thing so get geared up for that. But what we're going to share today and what we're going to talk about is fasting and how to fast and what that means. And oftentimes we've heard that fasting is taboo or skipping breakfast, the most important meal of the day. How can you do that? But I want to tell you that there's a lot of science uh, and importance behind fasting. And I want to talk about how skipping meals can heal. So we're going to be brief today. And so you can go ahead and go to the next one. We normally like to schedule with these lunch and learns, which will be every Sunday. We normally like to have a little nutrition piece and an exercise piece. Um, my my push-up person didn't pan out, so if anybody would like to demo appropriate to push-up form, I'll critique you and we can talk about it and show to the group at the end. So any volunteers for that? We'll come back to that. So we're just going to go over some fasting history, explain intermittent fasting and its practical applications. So. Part of what I teach um, is a plan that the SEALs use quite often with the nutrition piece. We also teach it at Fit Camp. It's taught at Duke University. They charge around $10,000 for the program at Duke. So really, this is a good deal. It's a free resource here on base. You can't beat that. The Cleveland Clinic and the Mayo Clinic is currently using the nutritional plan to cure glioblastomas, brain tumors. The University of South Florida is also using it with hyperbaric oxygen chamber and uh, this plan. So go ahead, next slide. So, starvation. When I say fast, this often is the first thought that comes to our mind. She's taking all our food away. She's going to make me starve to death. And I promise that's not what we're saying or suggesting. That is just a forced abstinence. So, next slide. Fasting is willing. And it's not just doing fast food. It's a, you know, it's a willing abstinence. And we were designed to be hunter-gatherers. So, when you abstain from food, we think your body releases this ridiculous amount of adrenaline to give you energy. You can work out while fasted and have crazy energy because you were designed to go hunt and gather your food. Now we don't have to do that these days, but we're going to come back to that. So fasting, again, it's time tested, thousands of years old, and you can research ancient cultures that have perform fasting for various capacities for uh, spiritual awareness, cognitive enhancement to healing, uh, preventing Alzheimer's. Um, in fact, the Nobel Prize 2016 was awarded October 5th. The Nobel Prize in Medicine, October 5th, for fasting. Why don't we talk about that a little bit more? That's a big deal, Nobel Prize, and it was actually in Japan, and he was curing Alzheimer's um, on little animals, little rats and whatnot. But Specifically, his prize was for autophagy, which means self-eating. Alzheimer's is a disease of excessive amyloid proteins in the brain. When you allow your body that pause, that rest in eating, it allows for those amyloid proteins to die. Then there's not an excessive buildup. So then there's an elevation of cognitive functioning, restored memories. They were able to reverse stage one and stage two of Alzheimer's. This is incredible, folks. Preventing insulin resistance, which is a big piece of, of health and issues and ailment, and we're going to talk about that, and even reverse the aging process, which is kind of exciting. Be young forever, right? So 
To eat when you are sick is to feed your illness. That's a, a famous saying from Hippocrates. He's widely considered the father of medicine, and he was also known to champion fasting. Along with Plato and Aristotle, they were really big. If you want to enhance your thinking, you want to enhance your brain, your brain wants you to fast. Go ahead. Ben Franklin, another champion. The best of all medicines is resting and fasting. You can even date back from Jesus Christ to Buddha, the Muhammad, all sorts of, and even today, ancient Christians, Jews, Muslims, they, they fasted in the past, they still fast to this day. There's benefits behind it for spiritual reasons and cleansing and purifications. And some people may be familiar with Ansel Keys. Ansel Keys in the 50s did a lot of research on fat and, and eating and various cholesterol studies that were later proved to be flawed. It's another conversation for another day, but he studied the Mediterranean lifestyle, and so that's really when they came out, oh, you know, the Mediterranean lifestyle, that's where it's at, it's so important. And what we forgot, that most of the population of Crete followed um, the tradition of fasting. So there, again, lots of history behind fasting. Insulin is a hormone that comes out in our response to food, specifically with carbohydrates and proteins. So we're going to come to a slide in a bit that's going to go into that and explain that a little bit further. Because eating the proper foods can reduce excessive secretion, but it doesn't lower the current levels. That's sometimes where fasting comes in for that. The key to prevention of this insulin issue um, is to occasionally abstain from food. Go ahead. So when we eat, or when we're stressed, our cortisol plays a big factor in that. And I'm sure this is a room full of people with no stress. It's just rainbows and sunshine and unicorns every day, right? So when we eat or we're stressed, up goes our blood sugar. So with that, your blood sugar is really high. So what does our body do to remedy that? You're only allowed 1.5 teaspoons of sugar in your bloodstream at any given time. It's about that much. It's not a lot. If you have more than that, then insulin gets secreted. Insulin comes out, it will then drop your blood sugar. How do you feel when your blood sugar is really low? You are now tired and hungry. Maybe you're not hungry all the time, maybe you're just tired. So what do we do? This is the three or four o'clock drag where we have the coffee, we have the tea, we have the candy bar, we have the something, the pick-me-up, and we eat, and then the sugar drops again, and then we eat, and the sugar drops again. So you're on this perpetual roller coaster of life, always being tired or hungry. So how do we get off the roller coaster? Just to kind of go over this a little bit further to understand what's happening with this insulin, my little cartoon version of what's happening on a molecular level in the mitochondria of your cell. It's much more complex than this, but for simplicity, I've drawn insulin as a key. These are your cells, and these are your sugar molecules floating around in your bloodstream. If you eat that sugar, it's floating in your bloodstream, it wants to get into your cell to nourish your body. So what happens, it cannot get into the cell without insulin. So insulin comes over, it opens the door, it allows the sugar molecules into the cell. Now, on the American diet, the cell's full. The cell's saturated. There's no room at the end. The door goes closed, slams shut. So what does the body want to do? It always wants homeostasis. It wants to fix this problem. So it's going to make more keys and more keys and more and more and more and more. Will excessive keys open a locked door? Absolutely not. It knocks on that door, and that's where we hear those words, insulin resistance. Oh, your insulin's not working. Is it really the fact that your insulin's not working? Or maybe you're drowning in sugar. So then what happens our body's fixing it with this excessive insulin because we can't have more than that 1.5 teaspoons of sugar in the bloodstream. It is going to take it over here to our liver and then it's going to convert it to fat. And depending on your genetics, you will now get fatty liver, you will get high cholesterol, or you're going to store fat on the tummy, waist, hips, and for the ladies, the thighs. Insulin's not nice. He's not your friend. He's here to make you tired and hungry Make your belly growl, make you gain weight, raise your cholesterol, fatty liver, all that. Insulin's the devil. He's not nice. Don't invite him over. We're going to try and keep him away. So depending on genetics, yes, it will depend if you get fatty liver first. Or maybe you just have a heart attack. Have you met that skinny little 150-pound guy having a heart attack? Yes. 
It's because of his genetics allowed him to have storage there instead of on his waist first. So those will depend, but this is how it happens. Excessive amount of insulin and sugar will convert to fat. If you throw a log into a fire, do you get a log back out? No. Eating fat doesn't make fat on a molecular level. That's false. We're one of very few countries to teach that. Next slide. What are our triggers for insulin? Refined carbohydrates, grains, and sugars. Carbohydrates specifically block your Sadie hormone, your leptin. That's why we like, never feel full, always hungry. You can eat that bowl of cereal or the granola bar, and you'd be starving and ravenous all day. Whereas if you skip breakfast, you're like, oh, I'm pretty good. I'm not hungry. Your body knows. You're dropping your blood sugar with those items, and you're starving. Frequent meals and snacks, that's not always a great thing. We're like, oh, i got to eat all every two hours to rev up my metabolism so I lose weight. The same concept applies to your pet. If you fed your dog every two hours, are you going to rev up his metabolism and help him lose weight? No. It sounds silly when you apply that concept to your pet. The same concept applies to you. These are some things that we just say to people, and there's no research to support it. It's so important with nutrition that we follow the research, and the problem is there's a lot of jaded information, a lot of false information from the food industries that often confuse us. Cortisol, stress, that's a major factor. That's a whole lecture for another day. Lack of sleep, again, because of the way it affects our cortisol and our stress. Artificial sugars, this can be a problem for people. They're like, oh, I'm doing great. I have this artificial sugar. But what happens with the sugar, it can still, especially for some diabetics, it, they will still see a blood sugar spike with the artificial sugars. The other thing that no one tells you with the artificial sugars is no one told insulin not to act on it. Yes, it may or may not raise your blood sugar, but insulin acts on it every time because insulin thinks it's real. So then now you're gaining weight from your artificial sugar. Protein, yes. On a molecular level, carbohydrates and protein will break down to sugar. So eating gobs and gobs and gobs of meat or gobs of protein shakes and protein this, protein that will break down into sugar and can contribute to insulin resistance and weight gain. So it needs to be a balance of your macronutrients. Thanksgiving, we have fat cat after Thanksgiving, right? Think about that. Tons of food. And we're so tired and so sedated. So what do we say? Oh, it's the tryptophan in the turkey. You'd have to eat about 25 pounds of turkey to get that much tryptophan. It's the carbs and the sugar coma that's happening. So next slide. When you have fast, these are two celebrities. A lot of people know these. These are two of many celebrities that fast. When people worry, oh, if I fast or I'm, I'm monitoring my carbohydrates or I'm monitoring my sugars, I can't gain muscle. I think these two were relatively fit specimen that, hey, they say, hey, we fast and we limit our proteins and our sugars. And I think they're doing OK. I don't know. <laughs> so it's possible. Um, even I think Mike O'Hearn, who's Mr. America, He's a faster and uh, lower sugar, lower protein plan. Fasting myths. This, this infamous starvation mode. There's so much research out there to support fasting. And if you truly look at the research, they've analyzed people with various complex tests. And what they've come to find is that you have to be less than 5% body fat before your body burns muscle. And that's, you don't see many folks that are walking around less than 5% body fat. So we could be okay if we skipped a meal here and there. Fasting will overwhelm you with hunger. Not so. Because of what's happening on an endocrine level, you often feel full much longer. Fasting can cause overeating. Again, not necessarily. Um, making you lose muscle, no. Fasting causes hypoglycemia. It really doesn't. And what we find is through fasting, you can stabilize that insulin roller coaster that we were talking about. You will be more stable and you'll ha stop having these periods of a severe hypoglycemia where you're constantly starving because you didn't take yourself to the top of the coaster. So, again, yeah, is it just crazy? Some people think so. Go ahead. So, if you're a vegetarian, you can fast. You don't like nuts, you can fast, right? Um, you don't do grains, you can fast. You don't have any money, you can fast. It's free. It's pretty easy. So why would we do it, right? To boost growth hormone, anti-aging things, reducing free radicals, re reducing cancer risk. So many, many, many cancer treatment facilities recommend 
fasting for periods of time to help reduce your cancer risks, um, stops your cravings, uh, lowers your triglyceride, can raise your HDL, it gives you energy. Adrenaline is released when you fast. And it can also, the most important thing is regulating those insulin levels. Because when your insulin is out of control, there's a cascade of other things and inflammatory processes that go on throughout the body. So go ahead. Benefits, I don't want to bore you by reading all of these. Um, but specifically, it'll boost your metabolism. It will help with energy. It helps with inflammation, joint pain, body aches. Uh, helps with uh, oxidative stress, improving your cell recycling. So uh, it's, it's generally just a wonderful way to promote health and wellness, and many countries do it on a regular. And if you travel even to European countries, I mean, they're, they're eating once or twice a day. You go to Guatemala today and the children are eating once a day. We're so consumed with all these meals and snacks and we forget how the rest of the world lives. We forget about the Native Americans or, or the Eskimos or the Inuit societies up north in ancient times and ancient cultures all over the world. They would eat once or twice a day and it was normal then. The brain, improved cognitive functioning. Who doesn't want that, right? Uh, reduces inflammation, it's wonderful for your heart. It can reduce your resting heart rate, reduce your blood pressure. Uh, helps break up fat cells, reduces inflammation, again, insulin sensitivity, better in the muscles, reduces um, energy uptake in your intestines. Wonderful reason, reasons. Uh, I don't want to bore you with that. Next slide. So let's talk about the different types of fasting. There's intermittent, alternate day, and extended. So if you're doing an intermittent fast, it's pretty explanatory, it's intermittent. So I tell folks to start with the basics, and then you progress yourself up. So an intermittent fast, with say a 12-hour fast, you would maybe eat dinner at 5 or 6, um, maybe have a snack at 8, and don't eat till 8 in the morning. Okay, you just made it 12 hours. Boom, you've, you've accomplished that. Or 6 to 6, or 7 to 7, you get the point. Just going 12 hours, and you sleep through most of the fast. You're probably already doing that. Breakfast stands for breaking fast. And when you choose to break your fast, it's truly up to you. The next step, if you've mastered the 12 hour, I say jump up to the 16, which is the most common, and a lot of people do these. The 12 and the 16 hour fast can be done on a regular basis and is completely healthy. A 16 hour fast, um, it's very militant actually. I mean, if you go to some of these military training things, you have like, your, your breakfast is at nine, lunch is at noon, dinner's at five, boom, your food's in an eight hour window and then you're fasting 16 hours. So some people say, oh, I can't eat like that. Well, there's no time of day that really matters. So people, you hear, don't eat after five, don't eat after six. Does it really matter? Absolutely not. It's the mat what matters is how many hours you went between your next meal. So it's maybe you eat at 10 o'clock for the first time, and then one or two, and then again at five or six. Well, then don't eat till 10 the next day. So you 10 to six, right, is your feeding window. Or, I don't know if you need any of that announcements there. Then you 10 to 6, 11 to 7, 12 to 8. 12 to 8 is a popular fasting time for a lot of people. Um, it really depends on you and your schedule. You need to have an 8-hour feeding window and a 16-hour fasting window. Then you can advance to the 20, which would lead maybe into the 24-hour fast. A 24-hour fast can be done once a week, twice a week, once a month. It's really a tool in your toolbox. And with any of these fasts, I tell anyone, if you don't feel good and you feel like you can't make it, quit. <laughs> There's no prize or reward for doing it, you know, but it's a nice challenge for yourself. So waking up, maybe you have, you know, a 24-hour fast would be like dinner. You would have your normal dinner. Breakfast, maybe you had a cup of coffee, a tablespoon of cream or so. Lunch, you had chicken broth or a bone broth would be most optimal where you've cooked the bones down and you get all the vitamins and the nutrients from the bones. And then dinner would be your normal dinner. So you, then you went from dinner to dinner, essentially 24 hours. You think about it that way, you're like, oh, well, that's not that hard. And many people say, oh, well, I like eating once a day anyway. In 36 hours or these extended fasts, some people go 21 hour or 21 days or things. is a real trendy and popular. Does anyone know the longest fast ever? 380 days. It's crazy. 
He was over 400 pounds. I'm not recommending that, by the way. But he was able to lose 200 pounds in that year, and he was monitored every day. Now, um, this took place in the 70s. I'm sure it would never be approved in today's time. But uh, it's a gentleman in, in Scotland, I think, and he still remains anonymous. But he was monitored on a daily basis. And I think he was 20-something with no real life obligation, so he had the flexibility to not eat for more than a year, which is kind of crazy and wild. But the point of that was to show that if you have body fat, you can get every vitamin and nutrient that your body needs. And subsequent studies have followed, enough for a gentleman to win the Nobel Prize. So go ahead. This gives you an example of that 12 to 8 fast, which is real popular for a lot of people. So they might wake up at 5 or 6 or 8 or whatever and have a cup of coffee. Maybe they sip on some broth, vegetable, bone, beef, whatever. And then they have their first meal meal, their solid meal at noon. And then, you know, maybe they eat again, maybe they hear, maybe they don't. You know, as long as you keep your food in an eight hour window and you're fasting the other times. So fasting fluids, things that would be permissible during a fast that don't seem to stimulate insulin. That's what we're looking at is trying to avoid insulin stimulation. So there may be some small caloric gain from here, but we're looking at insulin because that's being the key. So coffee, teas, limit your cream. I said a tablespoon, teaspoon. You just got to keep it in check because if you go wild with the cream, you're getting sugars and calories. Bone broth, we do recommend avoiding artificial sugars on fast day because of the way it stimulates insulin. Bone broth, preferably the bone as we talked about. Sometimes we splash a little oil or butter in it. It gives you just enough fat to fill you up and keep you full. People all worry about the protein filling you up. The fat can really be the one that fills you up. Listen to your body when it comes to the salt. On a plan like this, your body is constantly depleting itself of salt. People were paid in salt thousands of years ago, and we fail to recognize how important salt is to the body. So it is essential for every single cell in your body to function. You need salt. So listen to your body when it comes to that. Limit vitamins on a fast day. Your body thinks it's food. It creates an endocrine response, so be mindful. If you're going to do vitamins, you do it at dinner with your meal. And then obviously plenty of water. Stay hydrated. Sometimes there's a mild wave of hunger, if, depending on what you're doing. And if you've all experienced hunger before, it usually is a mild wave and it can go away. If anyone has any significant medical or health issues, it's always recommended that you negotiate these terms with your healthcare professional first before you go out and do anything too rogue here. So on the days that you're not fasting or the days that you're, you're off meals when you are eating, these are some suggestions that we recommend. Abundant oils, dressings, avocados, and olives that follows along with that Mediterranean lifestyle. Meat, poultry, beef, pork, and fish. Eggs tend to be unlimited. Dairy, try and you limit to about four ounces a day, nuts sparingly. Nuts have a lot of sugar in them. People worry about the fat. It's really the sugar in the nuts that you need to be mindful of. The same with the dairies, the sugar in the dairy. Veggies and salads. We can get into things like oxalates and histamines and nightshades that will affect you and create an inflammatory response. Um, but that's, again, conversations for other day. Fruit. People all want to say, well, it's, it's, you know, it's all natural. But what we need to realize is everything's been fooled with. A strawberry, for many of you, when you were younger, was about this big. It's this big. Banana was this big, and inside, when you crack it open, hundreds of seeds flow out into the floor like a pomegranate. We don't see bananas like that. We see a dessert banana that's yay big, and you, the seeds are peppered in there. You can barely see them. The same with a watermelon. You can't even find seeds in a watermelon. How are we tra traumatized today's children by swallowing a watermelon seed if we can't even find a watermelon with seeds in them, you know? So you have to be mindful of, of things have been fooled with. Fruit has been fooled with, vegetables have been fooled with, grains have been fooled with. Um, you know, it's all been fooled with to some capacity, even the animal products. So just be mindful of your products that you're purchasing. So fibrous fruits, non-starchy veggies and nuts, your fats, your eggs and cheeses, and your meats are certainly something we recommend. So if you were looking at macros, we'd say about 70% of your day being fat, 25% of your day being protein, 5% carbohydrate, because that protein and the carbohydrate will break down to sugar. That's the only thing that will not stimulate insulin. And we look at the, that macro count, and that's the exact macros of a breastfeeding baby. So I tell folks, if a baby can't be on your plan, then you shouldn't do it either. <laughs> so a breastfed baby is in a nutritional ketosis state. 70% of that breast milk is saturated fat. And you can lower cholesterol with saturated fat. I know that sounds crazy. 25% um, of it's protein, 5% carb. So. 
some case, some gal here, she likes to fast quite often. She's 70 pounds in seven months. Um, this gal, she's now actually down 130 pounds in 13 months playing with uh, the plan we taught and the fasting. So for then you go back to that picture there. She'd wanted all her life to zip line, had never been allowed to do it, and was finally able to do that. And she was on cholesterol meds and diabetic medication, and we got her off everything. Next one there. Some book recommendations, and we're hoping to post the slides for you so you can have some of those recommendations. If you want to know more about fasting, The Complete Guide to Fasting by Dr. Jason Fung, and I encourage you to check him out on YouTube or social media. He's posting videos about it all the time. And then uh, next slide, I think, are just some references. And that's, that's really it. So I've just kind of opened the floor for some questions, if you have any particular questions about fasting or any of the lifestyle options that we brought up here. Oxidative stress. So it's just a type of what's happening on a molecular level with oxygen, and it can it, it leads to free radicals and uh, rogue cells like cancers and things. So by reducing that, you're reducing cancer risks and aging. Any other questions? Yeah, I mean, what you would do, um, people do extended fasts all the time for, for many reasons, and I'm a big fan of that. Ultimately, um, you may want to consult with somebody to make sure you're not on any particular medication. Certain medications can affect your fast if you're medicated by any means. Um, but generally, if you follow some of the guidelines that we said here, 48, 36 hour to even a week fast if you wanted to, can be very helpful, healthy, and therapeutic. The hunger goes away after about day two, day three, because um, your body starts to burn up your, um, your glycogen stores at that point in time. So then you don't have hunger pains at that point. And then you'll be surprised at how much energy gets released and how you can even work out during a fast. We just broke the record. I think it was a 100-mile race. Uh, but uh, it's the same, I don't know. If, two hard-boiled hard eggs. Hard eggs. He broke the record by an hour. Not by like five minutes he was ahead of the crowd. By an hour he was ahead of the crowd eating two hard-boiled eggs and ran 100 miles. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's really cool stuff. They have uh, Olympians on this. They have various athletes all over the place. Um, it's, it's really exciting. I started the 16-8 uh, uh, fast a couple weeks ago. Yeah, I noticed the first week was kind of rough, but after that I got better. Mm -hmm. The more you do it, the better you will get, yeah. I got better if like running and stuff. I can run farther from now. And, uh, <clears throat> how long can I do that? Can I do that? You can do indefinitely, yeah. You can do a 12 and a 16 hour fast on a daily basis indefinitely, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's what I said. Pick the time that works for you and your schedule. It's, there's no hardcore, it has to be this eight hour regimen. It can really vary. Yeah. Any other questions? So, like the diet that, you're, that you have there, so what, so how wife she gets like headaches and starts to crash after a while, so you're saying yeah, you really have to cut the sugar. It, it's easier to do if you're kind of already on a sugar-free, starch-free plan to begin with. But oftentimes, the headaches come for two reasons. One is you're initially withdrawing. You will withdraw from sugar and starches if you're doing something like that. That usually takes a withdrawal period is about day three, day four, and you're out of the withdrawal period and usually start to feel better. Um, if you're persistent with headaches and such, it's usually because your salt level's too low. These plants put you into a state of diuresis. It, surprisingly, even fasting will help move your bowels. Like people are like, oh my goodness, I can't believe this. But people go to the bathroom more regularly, and especially during a fast, because it is the original cleanse and detox. So with all that, you're losing those fluids. With losing those fluids, your body's losing the salt. So you can end up with even Charlie horses, or even constipation, or headaches, or just feeling tired and fatigued, and it's because the salt levels are low. Where on the American diet, we're so salt phobic, we avoid it, and we need to definitely make sure we step up the salt by um, adding salt to your broth, or getting a bouillon cube, or eating olives with salt, or it, it, things, it, find out ways that you can increase the salt. And usually if you're on a fast, then you would do the chicken broth, but if you're eating, then you're just gonna be adding some salt to your food. Um, go ahead supplements that you would recommend to take during the fast? Not during the fast, because your body, we want the body to take from 
Mother Hubbard's cupboard, right? <laughs> we don't want to be given her extra stuff. And so by giving nutrients in, we tend to, we'll stop. We, we'll only take from those vitamins. I don't want to give it that. I want to take, technically, again, if you have more than 5% body fat, your body can take from your fat stores as a source of nutrition. That's where our vitamins and hormones and other things are stored. And then when your body starts doing that, I know it like releases a lot of weird hormones. So what's some like, like I, I, I've heard people like acne, you know, because those stores, yeah, I mean, I think it also depends on what else they're doing because some people will do some of those fasts and then they'll do like sugary shakes in between or other things. If you're truly cleansing and detoxing, the acne and all that stuff goes away because you're resetting the hormones. So it really does seem to make a difference in people's skins. I mean, it does improve generally if, you, if you're depending on how you're going into your fast and what you're doing in between your meals. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, um, we're big fans of that, and, and part of it is you have to kind of develop a system and a routine. The first day you fast, it might be difficult for you because your body's adjusting, but it's a period of what we call becoming fat adapted, where your body learns how to rely on fat stores versus relying on sugar stores. So imagine your body a, a stove, and if you constantly throw in the little pieces of paper and the kindlin, it's not gonna burn the log there. It wants to burn the quick and easy. And so the carbohydrates are the quick and easy, and the protein's the quick and easy. We wanna stop that, slow those down, and make it burn the fat for energy, because you'll get more energy, more stamina, more endurance, and then you can outperform someone just by simply running and living on your own body fat. Does that make sense? So it's just a transition period. Uh, yeah, you've got to get through the transition period of letting, and that can take some time. Um, but if you want, we can talk afterward about how that transition period works. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, yes. Are there any recommendations as far as um, breastfeeding mothers? Are they able to go through any of these facts without affecting that? I would say um, I wouldn't do more than a 12 hour fast if you're a breastfeeding mom. Um, I have three children, I breastfed with my kids, I, I played with fasting and nutritional ketosis with all. I would say limiting um, grains and sugars are fine during breastfeeding, but to go and do like a two or three day fast, it's gonna affect your milk production, so I wouldn't necessarily recommend that while you're actively breastfeeding. Okay. If you have detailed questions later, I'll be here. <laughs> yes? So what's your recommendation as far as where to start, uh, where you should maintain, just say over a month's time to see some of the benefits? So. I would, like I said, I would start at the beginning with um, the 12 hour fast. Just say, I'm not gonna eat after eight o'clock at night or whatever time, and I won't eat till eight in the morning. Just start with the baby steps with that, and people just start, they get more comfortable with it and lengthening their period. Because some people, when you look at it, I have some folks, you know, we're burning the candle at both ends, I'm going to bed, you know, it, maybe they're going to bed at 10, 30, 11, and they had a snack, and then they get up at five, and then they're eating again. So they barely went four or five hours or so in between meals, or, you know. So you really need to look at that. How often are we eating? Can we, can we stretch that period a little bit? And it's a really a struggle for some people just to start with a 12-hour fast. So I say start with the basics, you know, where you're trying to sleep through most of it and, and then easing yourself in. Is there a point where uh, the negatives outweigh the benefits? You know, are you going to hit a wall? Are you going to know when you get to that point? So what do you mean hitting a wall? Hitting a wall with what? Are you trying, are you, do you have a goal of like weight loss? Do you have a goal of more energy? Do you have a goal of? All the above. All the above. <laughs> so I, um, if you're looking at weight loss, it's much more than this. If you're looking at stamina and energy, it's more than this. This is just one piece of the pie, um, a sugar-free, starch-free pie. But, uh, but uh, this is just one piece of it. Uh, so th that's the hope is that as we can continue, we'll provide you with a little nugget each time you come to drill so you get a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, so you can put kind of the whole piece together. Because eat less, move more doesn't work. If it did, we wouldn't have a problem. 70% of us in this country struggle with weight in some capacity or aches and pains or digestive issues or, or a variety of ailments. 70% of us, those aren't the statistics in other countries. What's going on? We're being taught the wrong things. Eat less, move more, doesn't work. Calories are not equal. Is a gallon of gasoline and a gallon of jet fuel equal? No. So we need to know that one calorie of fat, one calorie of carb, one calorie of protein are different. They're burned differently, used differently, stored differently. So if you just said, well, I'm going to eat 1,000 calories, 
well, can you have 1,000 calories of Coca-Cola and ice cream? You're under your calorie count, but it doesn't matter. It's the quality, the quality that matters. So there's lots of different pieces from hormonal implications to neurological implications to psychological implications to a lot of different things. I know it's kind of a long, ambiguous answer. I don't know if that answered your question, but. I was just saying, like, if you're eating well, uh, solid, balanced diet like the pyramid, are you going to get to a point where the negatives are outweighing the positives? Like, if you could fast for two days, you say, all right, I'm pushing it to three. Yeah. I mean, there's going to hit a point when you're fasting, you're eventually going to have to eat again. <laughs> you can't just do it indefinitely. Um, and you have to look at your motivations and your reasons for doing that. I say start with, with what works for you. What's going to work for you may not work for this person or that person. So depending on your motivations, yeah, you're, you're going to try, you can try that. And if you're doing well and you're feeling good at day three or day four, okay, hey, you're doing great, keep at it. But there's going to come to a point that you've got to give nutrition back to your body. You know, you have to do that. Anyone else? The question on the salt, you say your body's going to know Both. Okay. Um, a, a bouillon cube has about a thousand milligrams of salt. Um, those electrolyte drinks that they sell, yeah. flavored and sugared, there's about less than a hundred milligrams in them. Yeah. So I mean, you barely get any salt from those drinks. You just get tons of sugar. Um, the best salt would be a spoon of soy sauce, or um, you know, the the broth, the bouillon cubes, olives. There's like a hundred milligrams in olives, so you could pop a few olives, you know, and get four or five hundred milligrams real quickly. Um, so, yeah, the point would be trying to f feel your body out, you know, do you need salt, do you need sugar? There's all been times where we've craved salt or craved something and that's our body telling us, hey, I, I need something. So it's a matter of sort of listening to some of those cues and not being so phobic of salt that we're afraid to add it to anything. Yes. So is there a question back here? Well, I noticed that you had on there that you can drink coffee and that, like during the fasting period, which is awesome news. Yes. So during a fast, we permit certain liquids, and these are the liquids that have been the most studied in research, and as you can imagine, an FDA-approved research study, alcohol and beer wouldn't be permitted on there. For one, you're going to get calories and sugar from those. Um, the, um, these particular items, you're getting a minute amount of calories and really no sugar, so there's no insulin stimulation. So when you're fasting, you're permitted liquids that aren't going to stimulate your insulin. So just an FYI, for alcohol options that are lower sugar, there is a Mick Ultra that's a 2.5 carb. Wine is three to five carbs per four ounces. Proseccos are like one to two carbs, um, depending on that. If you like a Prosecco liquor, no carbs. So some people call it the bourbon, bacon, and butter diet, the triple B. So um, just be mindful of your consumption of those products because they can, in excess, create a problem uh, with your success in losing. Yeah. And also, do you think that the 12-hour fast is sufficient just for your normal everyday? Yeah. I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of the 12 or the 16-hour fast on a daily basis and whatever one works easier for you. Um, and, and that's personally what I try to do, and I, I think it's a great option. And then throwing in the 24-hour, if you went to a wedding or a birthday or a holiday or you felt like you wanted a detox or a cleanse, then throw in the 24-hour in there every now and again. Yeah. Any other good questions? Now, where are we on time? We can include, include things. I don't, you know what time it is? Anybody have time? 22. 22. So unless anybody wants to demo some good push-ups, that was going to be my other plan today, <laughs> form and function. We can, yes, sir. Um, yeah, talk to you on Friday. Uh, but one of the prescriptions that I'm on can cause fluctuation of blood sugar levels. Uh-huh. How would you? Well, let, let us talk about that. Okay. Yeah, we'll talk privately about that so we don't have to disclose that. Any other good questions? If not, I thank you guys so much. The next one, we're trying to host these every Sunday, every Sunday of drill, noon in here. The next one's going to be sugar-free, starch-free, 
and we're going to have a challenge, a 30-day challenge, and we're we'll bring the body comp analysis in, so bring your friends, it should be fun. And then we're also taking appointments over at the clinic for nutritional consultations for your blood pressure, for your, you know, diabetes, for whatever your ailments might be, not just for people that are struggling with PT, but just to help in overall nutrition issues. So uh, keep that in mind as well. Any other good questions, comments? If not, we'll let you go. I'm sorry to keep you too long. Hopefully you found it informative. And see you all next month, right? Thank you. Thank you.